After we go to opportunity and you look at the Texas connection, which is what my book is about, everything that was involved in this assassination, pre and post, Lyndon Johnson was involved in. We can go to Jack Ruby. Ask Madeline Brown how she met Jack Ruby. Did you meet Jack Ruby, Madeline? Yes. Um, Lyndon Johnson's attorney introduced me to him. Go on. I'm serious. Where? I was coming out of Neiman Marcus and happened, of course, I knew the attorney, and he was standing talking to Jack Ruby, and he says, I want you to meet um, Jack Ruby. And um, so uh, I Wait still... Wait a second. When was this? Oh, 1952, I think. Way back. Ten you know? years before the assassination? Oh, yeah. So Lyndon Johnson's attorney, which one? Uh, Jerome Ragsdale. The same guy who wrote you the letter yes. after LBJ died yes. and said that the financial arrangements mm -hmm. would be continued. He was standing with Jack Ruby, you say? Yes. Did you ever tell any of the authorities this? Yes. Who'd you tell? Uh, well, I told, well, not the Warren Commission. They didn't talk to me. They didn't ask you no. to testify? No, I was Go told. Go on. I was told if they contacted me in any way... They should watch some talk shows, these guys. <laughs> I, I well, what'd you say, James? I said <clears throat> the Warren Commission didn't even talk to the closest witnesses to the assassination. Bill and Gail Newman, you know, they were right there. We all remember the pictures of them shielding their children on the grassy knoll. Warren Commission didn't even talk to them. And there were over a dozen witnesses on the overpass, every one of which was aware that the shots came from the grassy knoll from beyond the stockade fence. Only one was called. And when he said that the others saw the same things that he did, they didn't call any of the others. Craig Zerbel, who picked the Warren Commission? Let me just tell you this. What these two men are saying, who are experts in the assassination, is absolutely true. The Warren Commission was a politically biased entity created by Lyndon Johnson for the sole purpose of getting him out of another political scandal. This one, of course, the worst of his career. And the reason I say that, if you look back in history, 1963, November 22nd, what happened? The Texans came out and they said it was a lone killing, a lone assassin. And if you look at law, at the, ki the killing of a president in 1963, if it was caused by a lone assassin, was only subject to state, state jurisdiction, not federal. And Texans came out and they said it was a lone killing. Therefore, they had exclusive jurisdiction to investigate the case Craig, and prosecute. Craig, Craig, are you indicting the whole Lone Star State in your theory? I don't have to, Geraldo, and the reason for that is, if you look at history, and no one is going to deny it on this panel, on the evening of the assassination, the truth of the matter is Lyndon Johnson called people in Dallas, including uh, the Dallas District Attorney, and told him to charge Lee Harvey Oswald with being a lone assassin, regardless of whether anything else he could prove. Do you allege that LBJ himself called together a group of co-conspirators and said to them, I want this man dead. I want him to be killed in Dallas. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that he specifically ordered a murder? Absolutely. And in fact, if you go back and look at history, in 1961, Billy Saul Estes, who was one of the people involved with the scandal involving Johnson, has testified that Johnson ordered the killing of an agricultural agent down in Texas. That was when he was vice president. Uh, an in interesting point that Robert brings up when he discusses his theory involving a uh, secret team is that uh, what you state in your book is that the way we can determine the people who are involved in a secret team is by looking at who got the best jobs afterwards. And that's on page 439 of your book. Who in the world got the best job after the assassination? Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, Geraldo, if I may interject for a moment, you said who put the Warren Commission together. The answer is Lyndon Johnson. He appointed them. He asked Earl Warren to head the President's Commission. Uh, 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 Warren said no, he didn't want to do it. He was basically drafted by Johnson and told that he had to do it. It was a matter of national security, that if the truth were known about this, that, the, that, the, that it could lead to World War III. The phony evidence planted against Lee Harvey Oswald that he was working for Fidel Castro, had that been made known to the public and had they believed it, Johnson would have no alternative. He would have had to invade Cuba. Had he done that and, and uh, Castro survived and asked for help from Khrushchev, Khrushchev, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, could not back down a second time. This was the excuse. This was the cover. And this is how they were brought in. Uh, you mentioned about the, uh, about the making of the commission and who, who assigned them. Lyndon Johnson had made the statement that one of those uh, Warren Commission members, uh, someone who we all know named Gerald Ford, 
could not chew gum and urinate at the same time. I think that's a very accurate statement, but if he honestly felt that way about Gerald Ford, why did he name him to this most important of commissions? And worse than that, President Kennedy, after the Bay of Pigs, fired Alan Dulles as director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Dulles hated Kennedy. His whole career was ruined by Kennedy, and he got to be named one of the seven Warren Commission members. He certainly had an axe to grind. The late Madeleine Brown gained a unique insight into Johnson's role in Kennedy's assassination. She first met LBJ in 1948 at the Adolphus Hotel in downtown Dallas, when he was celebrating his election to the Senate following the infamous Box 13 scandal. I went, I was very young, and it was, it was wonderful. Uh, our relationship developed immediately. Lyndon gave another campaign party in Austin. It was three weeks after I met him at the Adolphus, <clears throat> and it was scheduled at the Driscoll Hotel. And, oh, it was so great to see him. I mean, for three weeks, I had thought about him and, and how wonderful it was. We were dancing that night, and he says, uh, I'll see you upstairs, and he put a key in my hand. I still have that key. <laughs> uh, it was exciting. I felt naughty, but I felt good. I fell deeply in love with him. Yes, I did. I was just the other woman in his life, and uh, my emotions are still the same for him as they were when I met him as a very young girl. But I'll always love him. He was the father of my son, Stephen. That intimate relationship with Johnson continued for many years. Through him, she became familiar with the closed world of power politics in Texas. On the eve of Kennedy's assassination, she attended a party at this house in North Dallas, the family home of oil billionaire Clint Murkison Sr. There was an extraordinary guest list that night. We had H.O. Uh, Hunt, Murchison, Lyndon Johnson made an appearance. We had Hoover. We had Richard Nixon. Uh, they were the most influential people there. But I was under the impression that since Jagger Hoover was there, that it was to honor Hoover rather than anything else. When Lyndon came in, no one was expecting him. So when Lyndon arrived at Clint Murchison's, they all went into a conference room. And you could just feel the, the atmosphere. And when Lyndon came out, uh, I was, of course, happy to see him. I did not know that he was going to be there. And he whispered in my ear at that time, those blank de blank uh, Kennedys will never embarrass me again. That's no threat, that's a promise. So he departed. The party rapidly broke up after Lyndon uh, departed. A seamstress and companion, May Newman, provides confirmation that this party took place at the Murkison family home on the eve of the assassination. She lived and worked in another Murkison house in Dallas for Virginia, Clint Sr.'s second wife. She speaks here for the first time. I started working for Virginia Madison in 1962 until her death in 1997, approximately 36 years. I remember well the night before the assassination. I worked with a uh, man called Jewel Pfeiffer, black man, which was uh, Virginia Murchison's chauffeur. He got a call from her stepson, John, at the big house, they were having a big party for a very special guest that was coming from Washington to go to the party by the name of Bulldog, which I found out later was J. Edgar Hoover. And um, he said he was very excited about doing this, going on this trip out to the airport to take this special guest to a very special party, big party. And I asked him when he came back if he got a good tip. And he said no, and he was very, very upset. He had to go back that night to take Jager Hoover to the airport to go, go back to Washington. And he still didn't get a tip. Further verification of Hoover's presence in Dallas on the eve of the assassination came from a friend of May's who worked at the Murkison family home. Beulah May Holman, she was the cook 
at John and Loopy's house. And she wanted me to go help her that night. 